if you've paid any attention to debates about politics and public policy in recent years, you're likely to have heard complaints about disinformation, conspiracies, social media pylons, and intolerance on campuses. For our next guest, all of these topics tie together in some ways. He explores them in the recent book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. The author's name is Jonathan Rausch. He is Senior Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Pleased to be here. So, the Constitution of Knowledge, what's that all about? Every society needs a way to figure out what's true and what's false, at least for public purposes. You don't expect people to agree on everything. There's only one way of doing that, that advances knowledge, provides peace, and protects freedom, and that's the Constitution of Knowledge. And that's our system for turning disagreement into facts. It's free speech, plus viewpoint diversity, plus all the rules of science that we rely on to keep ourselves disciplined. And when you put that together, you get the most amazing knowledge building enterprise that humanity's ever seen. So most people are familiar, at least to some extent, with the United States Constitution, a written document. Yeah. This sounds like it's not a written document, but something that has developed. Yeah, it's more like the British Constitution, which is an unwritten constitution. Yeah, I try to tell people the constitution of knowledge is not just a metaphor, it's not just a simile or some kind of literary device. It's a, it's a real thing. It's not written down, doesn't have a Supreme Court, but it's a whole set of rules for determining what's true and what's false, and it works very much like the U.S. Constitution. U.S. Constitution is decentralized, distributes power, uses power to balance power, sets rules that apply to everyone, like voting and how legislation happens. Very much the same is true of the Constitution of Knowledge. It uh, decentralized, lots of different people work on making knowledge. It's anti-authoritarian, it's liberal in the sense that everyone follows the same rules. You doesn't matter who you are, you should be able to contribute to the debate, bring in new evidence. If, if you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. And both of these things are a way of forcing social negotiations. The U.S. Constitution says if you want to make a law, you're going to have to compromise. That helps bring society together. It's a dynamic force. The world of the Constitution of Knowledge says if you want to go in the textbooks, you're going to have to persuade. You can't use coercion to do it. You're going to have to persuade people that you're right. That's how you make knowledge. And that's, that's the key. You get these masses of people that are working in this distributed way, but coordinated way, to create knowledge, truth, find truth. The formal U.S. Constitution arrived in the late 1780s. It's been amended by formal amendments and also amended in some ways by court decisions. How has the Constitution of Knowledge changed over the years, or is it something that was pretty well formed when it started? No, it's uh, Constitution of Knowledge actually begins being built in the, in the time of the founders. Many of the same people were involved. Um, and it's built on similar ideas like distributed authority and, and rules. But yes, it certainly evolves over time. One thing it does, like the U.S. Constitution, it brings in previously marginalized voices. You know, it used to be that scientists were white males. Um, that's not true anymore. It uh, used to be that ideas, um, ideas came from much smaller circles. The biggest change now in the world of science is the onboarding of huge numbers of scholars uh, and experts from the developing world and the huge internationalization of the whole exchange of not only science but journalism, the whole kind of creation of a worldwide web of knowledge on a scale that was unimaginable in the days of, say, John Locke. Uh, Isaac Newton, Benjamin Franklin. If I say U.S. Constitution, most people are going to, even if they don't know all the details, know that there is this document, they know what we're talking about. But I suspect for a lot of people, this uh, notion of the Constitution of Knowledge is something new. Is, is this a concept that a lot of people haven't really thought about, even if they've engaged in it? Well, unfortunately, that's right. You know, we, we I, I include myself, for a long time, the, the knowledge-making system that we rely on, so there are four big parts, I should say. There's academia, science, research, of course, that's the long pole in the tent. But there's also journalism, which is fact-based. 
There is government, which must be fact-based. We know from Orwell what happens if governments can make up facts and invent truth. And there's law, which is also fact-based and fact-driven. In fact, the idea of a fact arises in law before it comes up in science. Well, all of that seemed to work so well for so long that we got lazy. We assumed free speech is enough. But it turns out it's not enough because the marketplace of ideas is so easy to manipulate and to defraud. You need a lot of structure. You need all these rules that tell us how to engage each other, with each other in a way that's peaceful and productive. How to turn ideas and conflicts over ideas into knowledge. Things like don't use ad hominem attacks. Bring in evidence. You have to have empirical support. Structure your arguments in ways so that other people can rebut them. All kinds of structures like that and all these institutions like newsrooms and journals and, and periodicals, and government agencies, we need all of that stuff. And we took it for granted for too long. Now it's under attack, the second big theme of my book. Um, and we almost kind of forgot how to defend it or that we even needed to. You helped transition into where I wanted to go next, which was at the top I mentioned things like disinformation and conspiracy theories and people piling on social media. How do all of these tie in with the point that you're trying to make with the Constitution of Knowledge? Well, again, as with the U.S. Constitution, the Constitution of Knowledge has always had its enemies. There are always people who, for political reasons or opportunistic reasons or reasons of profit, think it would be much more convenient to substitute their own version of truth or to use demagoguery or falsehood or conspiracy theories or whatever it takes to get ahead. Um, and there are a lot of sophisticated ways that they can use to disrupt the constitution of knowledge. Two of them, the, I think the leading two right now, are disinformation and cancel culture. Very different, used by different sets of activists at the moment, but they have in common that they're both ways of manipulating and organizing the information environment uh, for political gain. And, of course, that's very much against the Constitution of Knowledge, which says the, the information environment needs to have as much integrity as possible. Well, these folks are out to disrupt that. We are chatting once again about the Constitution of Knowledge, a defense of truth. The author is Jonathan Rausch, Senior Fellow in Government Studies at the Brookings Institution. And people who read some of the description of the book will find that you, in some cases, are talking about things that are done by people on the political right, other times about things that are done by people on the political left. It sounds like folks of all political stripes ought to be thinking about some of these issues in a little bit more depth. Well, that's exactly right. So so-called canceling is the use of social coercion to chill conversation on topics that you won't, don't want people to talk about and to create a false consensus so you don't know what other people are thinking. You can do that on social media, for example. Anti-vaxxers did that very successfully, creating the impression that a lot of experts thought vaccines are bad for you. That's used at the moment, predominantly, uh, though not only by people on the left. These are the college campus activists who will get you investigated, for example, if you disagree with them, or the Twitter mobs that come after you. On the right, we're seeing the use of a different set of tactics, which are Russian-style mass disinformation. And that's where you put out so many falsehoods, uh, exaggerations, conspiracy theories, uh, and the like, so quickly through so many channels that people throw up their hands. They give up. They become cynical. They no longer know what to believe or who they can believe, or even if there's anything that they can believe. And that's a way of demoralizing and dividing your target population. And that's what we've seen uh, predominantly come through on the right, the American right, unfortunately. Stop the steal, I think, is an example of that. But we need to remember that these tactics are as old as the hills, and they're subtle, and both sides can use both of them. So this isn't about the particular politics. This is understanding how people can go about undermining the things that we need to do to stay in touch with truth as a society. So if people are trying to undermine the constitution of knowledge, what do we do about it? Well, a lot of different things. You know, the frustration with talking about this is you want to be able to say, here's the three item list. But it's not like that. This is going to be, and has been already, institutions of different kinds fighting back in many different ways. But it's got to be things like everything from universities becoming better about free speech and viewpoint diversity. I'm in town in uh, Raleigh to talk to a university about this. 
so that they can become better citizens, better stewards of the Constitution of Knowledge, which depends on diversity. It means media getting smarter about disinformation. That's happened, actually. We're making progress. 2020, mainstream media were much less permeable to Russian and foreign disinformation. Um, it means doing work uh, to educate students and other people better on how disinformation works. It means kind of preventing it uh, with some um, what's called um, cognitive immunology. It turns out if you can expose people preemptively to some disinformation, you can help them protect against it. And a brilliant example right now is the Biden administration's unveiling of intelligence that exposed Russian disinformation before they were able to launch it. That actually turned out to be quite effective at undermining their ability to confuse us. So it's going to be many things on many levels, and there's something each of us can do in our own institution, in our own life. Well, if you'd like to learn more, you can read the entire book. It is, once again, called The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. Its author is Jonathan Rausch. He is Senior Fellow in Government Studies at the Brookings Institution, and as he referenced, the 2022 Pope Lecturer at North Carolina State University. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you. And we thank you for watching at Carolina Journal.